Good evening. This is George Fitzgerald on 92.5 Phoenix FM. The name of the show is called Motivational Journeys. Welcome to the show. Most weeks what I do is I endeavor to take some experience from my own life and project it onto others in the sense of trying to enhance or help in some way their experience of life if I can. It's called Motivational Journeys. However, in saying that, this week we're going to be look at something slightly different. I don't think the week should go by without us acknowledging the very fact of the man whose life depicted a powerful heroic figure that crossed their nation, Sir John Neal. Sad as it was, he went the way of all the earth, and yet under the coronavirus, he didn't get the send off that he should have got. But right when he did, in my heart, as I followed his career, I looked at his career and how he, and what he endeavoured to do, and the very fact of how he held on to his integrity, and the obstacles that he had to overcome, and the vision that was in front of him, and his refusal under horrendous opposition, to change his course but continue to go on in his journey to bring peace not only to his own life but also to a nation, particularly to a nation that was very troubled, Mr. John Young. And I think his life is basically the epitome of probably how we all should live. And we're going to look at probably how he overcame or the obstacles that he overcame and very few of us will ever have to go through what he went through. But however in saying that, we have a fantastic example to take into our own personal experience in life and how we overcome injustice. Because each of us in this world in some case, some time of, in life, suffer from injustice. It won't be on the scale, obviously, or the international scale or the place in which John Hume came from. That's quite obvious. But however, in our own personal experience, trauma, injustice, things that happen to human beings in their own experience is their own experience. So with further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break. I'm going to bring in a track. And first and foremost, the track is going to be a little bit of it jazzy track. I'm going to keep with the team today, a little bit of jazzy tracks going on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in a Georgie Benson type riff guitar. The reason being is that anyone's involved in creativity, and I'm sure there are loads out there who are, they will understand the whole process of creativity and what a wonderful gift it is, regardless whether it's writing, whether it's art, whether it's painting, whether it's drawing, whatever it is. There's a method I use sometimes, not all the time, obviously. Yeah, particularly if I'm doing maybe drawing or write, painting or things like that. Not so much writing, but stick on the kettle there, get the coffee boiling, and put on a jazzy sound. And generally what I like to do is keep it within the sort of uh, instrumental, because there's no voices roaring at you. Just the instrumental music. And as I said, we're going to keep with the tracks and keep with the, the one I'm going to do is the, the Georgie Benson type track, the little bit of a guitar riff. Anyway, further ado, I'm going to bring in the track and we'll come back and we'll discuss the life of Mr. John Young. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, I hope you enjoyed that track. I like to play those tracks sometimes. We're going to play a track later on. It'll be a saxophonist, as I was a saxophonist myself. And as I said earlier, sometimes in the whole creative mode, for anyone that's out there who is creative, unless you're creative, you don't understand what I'm saying, but the fact of the matter is, get the kettle boiling, have the coffee on, let the music play, and sometimes conjure up these creative juices where you can go into this world and, cre and create it's a masterful art. It's a wonderful pastime, regardless what it is, whether it's music, whether it's writing, whether it's drawing, whether it's painting, whatever it is, you're creating a world within a world, and it's in your own personal time and your pastime that can be spent for hours. You can get lost in the whole thing. It's wonderful. However, let's go back to the story which I opened up earlier. Mr. John Hume. I suppose if you really wanted, you could nearly sit down and write a book that would be as thick as a cyclopedia on this man's life. We're not going to do that, because obviously we haven't got the time and the very fact of the matter is, unless you're an absolute avid fan or an avid follower of them, you may be uh, find it a little bit laborious listening to what we're all. But however, in saying that, Mr. John Hume was, without any doubt, as I said earlier, a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. There's no doubt about that. He was born in poverty in Derry, and he grew up, and then he, when he went to Minute, he studied to be a priest. Interesting there. Why was he drawn to that particular style of life at that particular time in, in, in his life? We don't know. Or maybe somebody does, people who really know him well or understand his history. But anyway, he went to Minute, I think it was, to study to be a priest. He didn't stay there. Uh, he obviously then chose a different career. He became a school teacher, as far as I know. And then somewhere along the line in his life, he, 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 he bid on, he held on to the idea of a peaceful nation, of bringing peace to this nation. From what I understand, he was very inspired by Martin Luther King and his peaceful approach to bringing peace to a nation. A different nation, obviously, with a different problem. But however, in saying that, in order to really grasp and understand the whole uh, experience of Mr. John Hume, you probably have to understand the area of 1970. Belfast, Antrim. What was really going on? Now, obviously, a man of my age... I didn't live, live up in Derry, I didn't live in Belfast, but I remember very clearly in the 70s, waking up in the morning and listening to the news, the news would be on, the radio would be playing there, we hadn't got the internet, television was very limited, we had the radio in those days, and practically every morning you'd get up, be getting ready to go to school, and you'd hear the news, and the news was reporting about another bomb, another killing when it went on up in Northern Ireland. And it had that little bit of a threat there. Because it wasn't in a different country, it was in our country, and it went into the subconscious mind probably that this could happen here. And obviously, it did the bombings of Dublin and Manhattan at that time. But however, to really grasp, as I said, to understand what he went through, you have to really take hold of the time and the place and the, and the part of the country in which he came from. But he did do this. Without a vision, my people perish. And he had a vision, and the vision was other centered. How many times in your life can you hear people selling the same message? But it all pales very insignificant when you compare it to the life of a man who walked it out. It's easy to sell a message, it's easy to even write a book about certain things, but the very fact of the matter is it's easy to talk, 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 but this guy lived it. He lived it in the practicalities of every single step that he made, and he held on to his integrity during all of it. And what he had to do and what he had to go through, the obstacles that he had to go through was cementable, was absolutely incredible. And yet he still, he still stayed there. I think, I'm not using the word rocket launcher, it wasn't a rocket launcher obviously, but his house was bombed or blown up or set on fire. It was constantly being threatened by not only, not only the obvious people who were his opposition, but also others. And we know during the course of the history that a British government and the Irish government had laid down a specific principle, and the principle was, you do not engage with people who are involved in terrorism. You don't talk to them. John Young did. Why? Because he believed if you don't talk to them, how are you going to know what they want? Now we can go into the whole story of how he, went, he took it from where he was and went to where he had to go, and all those obstacles that he had to come through. But however, we know the end story. We know the end story here. We know the end game. The game changer. John Hume came along. Not only, it wasn't only himself. We also understand there was other people around him. But however, what he did do was he brought peace to a very troubled nation. And particularly the part in which he lived in.
And in doing that, what did he do? John Hume took the gun, the bullets and the bombs out of the hands of the terrorists. And he silenced the cry from the grave. He saved thousands of lives. People that would have been born into that part of the country without John Hume would have grown up in a very troublesome, dirty, Belfast, Antrim, who would have been involved in terrorism themselves. He changed the whole course and the whole history of a generation that would follow. He allowed children to be born into this country that would never know the sound of a bomb. They would never have to duck a bullet. Women, young women, would never stand at the graves of their sons, screaming, crying, echoing out into a nation, falling on deaf ears of many people. He silenced the grave. He saved thousands of lives. John Young. If ever a man walked across this nation and was sent from God, as I said earlier, from my perspective, it was John Young because he couldn't have done it otherwise. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break right now and I'm going to bring in a trek. The track I'm going to bring in, I've chosen today, is we're going to keep it to a little theme, and the theme is a little basically to keep it sort of jazz, jazz it up a little bit because of the subject of the matter, and also the fact that, uh, that uh, just to keep it a little bit life and lively. And this, the track I'm going to choose here is because the reason I'm choosing it is because it's a saxophonist, it's a saxophone, and it's a saxophone jazz, and it's a thing that I do use sometimes as I'm drawing and painting, as I said. Anyway, further ado, we're going to break with the track. We're going to come back and we're going to look at what can we learn from Mr. John Hume in their own personal experience. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that track. It's a little bit of a saxophone there playing. Wonderful. At times when you're just, as I said earlier, and if anyone understands the experience, I suppose that's what it is. It's an experience. An experience to take the canvas out and take all the colours and paint. Let the music flow. Wonderful. However, let us go back to 
is a John Young. Or let us take an example from his life and his life experience. One thing that came across for me when I was looking at his obstacles and the obstacles that he has overcome, which is incredibly traumatic. How the man survived this is beyond us, but however he did, and we also understood that Mr. John Young came and went and left a mark not only in this nation but also in the nations of the world because in, I think it's Oslo, I'm not sure, too sure, stand to be correct on that point, all the Nobel Prize winners are there and there's uh, photographs of, of Gandhi, of, of Martin Luther King and John Young's right there in the middle of them, an Irishman. However, let us take a look at what it was he developed within his own character. It is essential, it is important to understand the only thing that we live on this earth when we depart from it is our character. If you stand around the grave of people that have died or have left the earth, nobody, very rarely, talks about their success, talks about their money, talks about uh, anything they've projected in this life or left behind them. Generally, it's, he was a good man. She was a good mother. He was a good son. He was a great father. It's always to do with the characteristics in which we left. So what was it he did to get him to where he was, to sustain him through what he had to go through? It's very simple. The real guy divides up the plastic people. The people that pretend Mr. John Hume was a nice man. No. Mr. John Hume was a kind man. There's a difference between nice and kind. The nice man will tell you what you want to hear because he has a self-interest. The kind man will tell you the truth. And see, sometimes the kind man is misunderstood. It depends, again, on the circumstance in which you're in to understand the difference between somebody putting you down and somebody being very constructive in that criticism towards you for your betterment. It depends, again, on the mindset, on how we receive certain things. Very few of us in this world, or from the experience that I've had walking through this life for 55 years, very few people will take ownership of their faults, will take ownership of the things that they did wrong. I'm not saying nobody will, very few do. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The person who will acknowledge the things that he did wrong in order to help the situation that he finds himself in. As I said, there is a difference between Mr. Nice Guy and Mr. Kind Guy. I know people who would be deemed, referred to, spoken about as nice people. And I have no doubt they are nice people. But they're very unkind people. They're not kind people. They're nice people. See, Mr. Nice Guy does everything from a self-motive. He wants to win the crowd. He wants to win and appease the people. There's a self-interest there. It's really all about him. But Mr. Kind Guy, he has other people centred. He's constantly looking at the betterment for other people. There's a difference between the two of them. I'd rather be around Mr. Kind than Mr. Nice. Because Mr. Nice will tell me that painting you've done is very good. Mr. Coyne, man, he'll tell me. Don't overwork that. I think you need to scrap it and start it again. Kindness is truth. Truth is always found in kindness. And kindness is not always received. Sometimes you will come up with great obstacles if you're a person of that particular, or you carry that particular personality. Mr. John Young was such a person. He was a kind man. He was another Pierre since he was people-centred. Everything in his life was projected towards others. Now you can get people that are basically experts in talking about these things. <coughs> but their life doesn't portray it. Their characteristics, their attitudes towards life actually betrays them. And yet, in the delusionary minds and the deception that they live in, they can't even see it. And the amazing part is, in many times, in many places, you get people like that who have 
uh, a pull over others, and they're as blind as they are. Developing the characteristics of a particular person is a, is a great quality in life, and yet the only way you can go through all of that, sad to say in this world, and this is the reality of the life that we live in, the world that we live in, is the very fact that the only thing that can actually enhance or create or craft away or cut away the things of our lives is basically through hard times. Hard times come to craft and to mould us as human beings and how difficult that is and how difficult it is to accept. It's difficult to accept that sometimes. And that, but that is the reality of life. The reality of life. Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson are... Fighters, real fighters, boxers, men who got into the ring and traded punches with other men and came out heroes, gallants, gallantry men, men who won victories, who won great titles. Most of them will tell you they learned more in their defeats than they did in their victories. The defeats showed them something about themselves, exposed the weakness that they take, had to take ownership of and taking ownership of, they progressed. They didn't make excuses. They didn't make excuses or lie to themselves, saying, no, there isn't. No, they looked at what, where, where the fault was, they addressed the fault, they took ownership of it, and then they began to start endeavouring to change. Changing life only comes through generally hard times, from my personal experience. And every one of us on this planet are going through the same things, that is not at the same times, but difficulties that, as they are. The fact is, difficulty comes to everybody's door. Problems come to most people's lives. But it's taking a look at it, and it's taking a look at what am, how am I reacting here? How am I reacting here? Am I taking ownership of my emotions? Am I letting my emotions run amok here? Or am I taking control of these emotions? Now, this can be all very difficult at times. This is not an easy path to walk on, but it's a path we have to walk on, to be absolutely honest with you. As I said, Mr. Nice Guy, Mr. Kind Guy, which one are you? Are you nice and kind? Are you people-centred or self-centred? You can come across, and I've met, I've met a, lot, a lot of people through the paths in which I've gone in life, and I've met a lot of people who do come across as Mr. Nice Guy. Get to know them, hang around them for a while, and you'll understand. They're very unkind. They're only kind to themselves. They only help others for themselves. Everything... Everything points back to them, projects back to them. John Hume wasn't such a person. That's why he stood out in the crowd. That's why he stands out in history. That's why his name will be remembered. As long as this world goes around and around and around, and in 100 years' time, or 150 years' time, whatever the case may be, Mr. John Hume's name will be always mentioned. The historians will write great stories about this guy. And it isn't the very fact. See, what we see is we see the end result. The end result of what he done and the peace in which he brought to this country. But the reality is that is only the physical manifestation of the man who he was inwardly. The man who he was inwardly. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a break and we're going to bring in a trek and we'll come back to this in a few minutes. Thank you.
Okay, what I've done there is I've played a little jazz track again. We started off with the guitar riff. Then we went into the saxophonist. And then what we did is play a little bit of light music there. The piano, the jazz sound. For somebody that's sitting in traffic maybe and they have the radio on and just want a little bit of quiet, a little bit of quiet. Not everything appeals to everybody and generally what I normally do as anyone knows, we generally play a different type of music. But today I just felt to go with this whole theme of the jazz thing for whatever reason i went with it anyway it's gone we've done it it's there however in saying that where were we at, we are talking about characteristics the attitudes the attitudes of life how to develop and create them and again as i said from my own personal experience and it is my own personal experience and i've had a lot of them uh, it only really comes through difficult times where we begin to start understanding how we are really behaving one of the most beautiful things in a human being upon this planet, I think, is to see somebody who will actually take ownership of their lives. Whether good, bad, and indifferent. One of the most ugliest things is to see somebody who doesn't. That's difficult to witness at times. You see, because the person who doesn't own up to take, take responsibility of what they've done wrong, you can never deal with them. You go, around in a, you go around in a circle upon a circle upon a circle and you'll actually find yourself getting nowhere. From my own personal experience, I am not in any way saying or any way comparing under no wise, am I just saying that to John Hume. However, I've come up against a lot of injustices through my experience and the thing about my experience in this particular field in which I find myself in is this, is that I'm not alone in it. We have discussed, I have discussed with many writers, writers that I know, their experience in writing, and basically a lot of it has to do with the same type of, I'm going to use the word again, experience, excuse me, for constantly using the same word, but that's what it is, it's an experience. So if you're out there and you want to write, let me just give you a recap and let me just break it down for you. If you're desiring to write, unless... You are an absolutely brilliant bestseller. And it doesn't mean you have to be a brilliant writer to be a bestseller. And it doesn't mean you're not a brilliant writer if you're not a bestseller. However, there is no money in publishing. There's no money in it. So if you're, in, if you're thinking in your head, get into the writing game, become a millionaire, become a J.K. Rowling, become all these type of guys, Dan Browns and all the rest of it, they're far and few between. Generally, generally as statistic states, most authors will sell 50 copies of their book. Average. That's the average. And for example, if your book is selling online for 99 cents, you will probably get 30 cents from Amazon. 30 cents per download. If it's selling in the, in the shops and you're, and, and you're selling it at 10 euros, you'll get prob approximately through a traditional publishing company, you'll get one euro. One euro. It doesn't matter how many times they write about you, it doesn't matter what's in the paper, it doesn't matter anything else. Does that generate sales? Generally not. However, generally not. And that is in itself very, very, a very, very difficult task, by the way, to actually get somebody or to get anyone to write about you at all. And if you don't believe that, go ahead and talk to writers and they'll tell you the exact same thing. Unless you're very fortunate in the sense of, or somehow have some sort of notoriety behind you. You probably won't even get a paragraph in the newspaper. However, in saying that, it isn't about the writing at all. It isn't about the success or the accomplishment. To misunderstand that. The real artist loves the work, regardless whether he's a painter, whether he's an artist. In actual fact, there was a time in the world where artists were seen as people who weren't to make money. And if people did make money through their art, the artists didn't look upon them as artists. Can you imagine that mentality? That was the philosophy of the time. Obviously, it changed as the years went on, and we've seen a, a flip side of the coin. You're only an artist if you make money. That's a lie. Not at all. Writing, creating things is basically your pastime, which you do, and if you are genuinely, in, sin, sin, really sincere in the artistic approach that you take towards the projects that's laid before you, the accomplishment of the goal is to actually see it finished. What comes after that? Who knows? And if you take a look at the lives of, say, for example, people that have succeeded in life, in that one particular area of life, Elvis Presley, Whitney Houston, Amy Winehouse, George Michael, Michael Jackson, 
If you take a look at these people's lives, and there's a lot more of the Marilyn Monroe and people like that, if you take a look at their lives, it wouldn't be somewhere you'd really want to go, would it? Because ultimately, they were very tragic, really. They succeeded in one part of their life, but he seemed to ultimately fail in the rest. Yeah, it's not really, in a sense, is a delusion. Come up here, this is where the world is. This is where great things happen. <coughs> Bit of a delusion, really, isn't it? Success in your own life is your own personal walk. What you accomplish, when you accomplish something, that's your success. That's what, we, that's what you deem as your success, you've accomplished it. You started a project, you went through the project, and you finished the project. That's it. Whatever comes after it, comes after it. You mightn't even like what comes after it, but the point being, rejoice in where you are at this moment. The obstacles that are laid before you is, now, let me just explain this to you. I have been known, to, no, known as being, I am in my own experience of life, I have been a champion boxer, I have been, we've, this has been very well documented, I'm going to run through it, sometimes I get bored talking about it, but anyway, just to say something, I've been a champion boxer, I've been a, a motivational speaker at times, I've been a radio broadcaster, director of things, I'm working on a documentary at the moment, I'm doing a lot of things, I'm a writer and all these other things, blah, 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 blah. However, what I'm saying is I have a lot, of, a lot of experience in life. But one thing I will say to anyone that's out there, and we've discussed this, I've discussed this openly with a good friend of mine, writer, Michael Daly, who's written a couple of books. He's also a radio broadcaster, and people like him, I've discussed things. We've discussed our challenges, our obstacles that's laid before us, and they will all come into agreement with what I'm going to say next. When you go into the business of writing, you're going to go into a world where you're going to see people's lives change in the sense of you're going to, they're going to view you differently. And you're going to probably come across people that you would never have believed and see the change in them. What I'm saying is, jealousy is absolutely huge in that business. It's not there in boxing. It wasn't there in the music. It wasn't there in, the, it wasn't there in arts. It wasn't as much there. I'm not saying it wasn't there. But however, I found from my experience, and I have a lot of it, as I said, that's what you're going to come across. That's going to be the one big obstacle probably for you to overcome. And ironically... Here's the irony of life. In a particular social standing in which I involve myself and have been involved over the years, the people that stand up and publicly sell a message of encouragement, hope, of creativity, of all this type of thing, and openly open the doors and open their hands and embrace this eulogy of speaking about such things, when you go knock on the door, you'll see a completely different result. I mean to the point of absolute shocking. I know these people, for example, I know of these people, of certain people that really talk about the essence of courtesy and kindness and greatness and developing characteristics projected to one particular individual that we all centre around. And yeah, when you send them 30, 40 emails, not one of them reply. The simple thing is, is common courtesy is not very common. Manner seems to be left out. What I'm simply saying to you is this, to avoid the shock of what comes your way when you endeavour to go on to this particular path, you will encounter this type of people. See, the reason is because most or a lot of people that are in these positions have a delusionary mindset. And what they, what in their delusionary mindset, they see you as the competition they see you as, the, as, the, as, as somebody who's basically a contender. The question I have for you is this. Who benefits from knocking the contender out of the way? Who benefits from hiding the contender in the corner? If they see you as a contender, they'll knock you out of the way. If they see you as a contender, they'll try to hide you in the corner. Who benefits from that? The self-serving person who says one thing and lives another way. What am I saying here? What I'm simply saying here is this, is that there's no money in publishing unless you're absolutely incredibly fortunate. You're going to come up against these particular obstacles and there's going to be a lot of obstacles in your way, but this is the one thing that will rise its head and it has not only been my experience, but my experience, to be honest with you, because of the particular people that I have been surrounded by, is very extreme. But however, in saying that, it's a broad experience for anyone that seems to have the ability to write or involve themselves in literature. So what I'm simply doing is I'm laying out the groundwork for you. 
Don't be surprised at the rejections. Don't be surprised at people that come along and to ignore you. The word, under, the word to undermine, you've been around certain people and they will undermine you. What it basically means is, I'm just going to paraphrase here, what it basically means is to actually cancel the effect. So in other words, let's just tell a story here. Let's just tell a story. The fact is, you've written a story, your bu book is being published and you're in the newspaper and you go to particular friends and you show them, for example, what it is and all of a sudden they begin to start talking about other things and completely ignore what's going on there and you look at it strangely and weirdly, say, what's going on here? And you say, oh, maybe they overlooked it. No, they didn't. They undermined it. Why was that? The cancel the effect. To be undermined, to be ignored, all these things. These are the obstacles that you will, in, you will actually be confronted with. As you go towards this particular path, if you're choosing to go to this path. But however, rejoice in the very fact that you started the walk, you finished the walk, you accomplished it. Regardless of everyone applauds you, anyone else, you are the one who done it, you are the one who achieved it, and you are the one who accomplished it. And the very fact is that you've risen, you've risen something in others because of the very fact they know what you've accomplished. Be of good cheer, keep going, keep travelling down that road and keep, keep on keeping on. Keep developing the craft of writing. Don't let people stop you, don't let experience stop you, don't let anything stop you. Keep going down that path. Under no circumstance let the small-minded, pea-minded people get in your way and these people to be an obstacle that will stop you endeavouring to go to where to the next level takes you. And keep going, don't stop. Because this is not a personal experience. It happens to us all. In my experience, it has been extreme. But however, I look at it as a great challenge of what is it doing to me and how can I change my motives and my heart and what's going on within me. Simply put, see what they're doing and go and do the opposite thing. Come back to you in a few minutes. The track I'm going to play here, now again, I think, for example, just for a little bit of encouragement for myself, is this track that I played earlier. I like that old uh, saxophonist, so I'm going to give it another ring here. So I'll talk to you in a few minutes. Hope you like that track. I replayed it again, as you see, as you heard, if you listen to the show. So where are we today? I hope this information that I have experientially and being involved in will help you. That's the whole purpose of the show, really. 
in a sense, is to motivate, but also to explain, to encourage. The very fact is not to avoid the paths that there are ahead of people that try to endeavour to do something in this world as far as creativity is concerned. These are the obstacles that will come, up, will come your way. And most of the time, if I'd only known, if I'd only known, that's the saying that people know, people say, if I'd only known then, right now, now, so I'm making it, I'm putting you away it, put it that way. These are things. Now, it might not necessarily be your personal experience. You might find it differently. You might have a great experience, and I'm sure there are other people out there who can tell you, no, well, that didn't happen to me. But however, in saying that, just be aware. And if you're writing, remember this. Write, write for the purpose of writing and nothing else. Develop the craft. Keep going where you're going. If you're playing music, play music to develop the craft. If you're drawing, painting, whatever you're doing, if you're involved in documentaries, films, whatever it is, if you're out there and trying, and it's a de very difficult business. No point saying it's not. The irony of it all is, in, in times past, it was much more difficult. It could be more easier today, and yet it seems to be more difficult. It's very ironic. Like, for example, years and years ago, not that long ago, by the way, we're only looking at probably 15 years ago, 10 years ago maybe, you had to go through, if you're going to write, for example, or see your work published, you had to go through a traditional publishing company. And generally, not all of the time, obviously, this is not the case, but you have to go through major rejections. I don't know whether it stands, I stand to be corrected on this point, for example. J.K. Rowling, I think, I stand to be corrected on this point. I heard it once said that she was rejected by 23 publishing companies. And what happened there, that's if the story's correct. You hear these stories and they don't always be correct. But however, what happened there was, from what I believe, is that she handed the manuscript to an editor in a publishing company. And the editor in the publishing company brought it home and gave it to his daughter and said, here, have a read of that. And he taught him more of it. And then a couple of weeks passed, whatever the story was, he was having breakfast one morning and he just happened to turn around to his daughter and say to his daughter, Oh, by the way, did you finish the manuscript I gave you? And she says, yes, Dad. Can you get me any more of that? That became the catalyst that set off the whole, uh, how do you, the whole story of J.K. Rowling and what went on. The point being here is you don't give up. You don't give up regardless. You don't give up. You don't stop. The only time you stop is when you go to sleep forever. Other than that, you keep going. You recognise that this is not a personal thing. This is part and parcel of the, of the whole process of growing inwardly and growing outwardly. And when you arrive there at that particular destination, that you'll probably be, be able to contain what's going on in your life at that moment. Now remember this. Remember this in life. Don't waste thousands of moments to get to a moment that will only last for a moment. Because that's all it'll last for. It'll be a moment. And that moment will come and go. There's an awful lot of moments in between all of that. So there's no point wasting all those moments. Here's a key I have learned. Or a you sometimes. When you get into this place where you're bogged down with this particular project. You're having difficulty. You're having a lot of difficulty in it. Because that's part of, as I said, change your mindset. It can sometimes be a simple thing of just leaving it alone, go for a walk, go for a jog, go into the gym, do something different, take your mind completely out of it. Because if your mind is in it and your mind is being troubled by it, well then the simple thing is take your mind out of it. Not always the most easiest thing to do and sometimes a lot of things we get told when we're actually in the center of it doesn't really apply to us. And the reason why it doesn't really apply to us is because we are too, too emotionally bound to the thing. We are caught up in it emotionally. But the only way to change that is to change the mindset and to be pragmatic but also aggressive in your approach towards, I have to do something here. My mindset is too involved in this. Get out of it. Bring the mindset somewhere there, somewhere else. Now, that's not always the case. I was watching a program there recently, a documentary about uh, Iraq and what went on there. What I'm saying is, I'm saying these things over the broad 
normal every other day simple experience that we have in our western culture i'm not talking about what goes on in iraq and people that have severe severe experiences one account of the documentary which i saw was a chap <coughs> he was talking and he said that he told his parents that they needed to live that he needed to go to live in syria they refused they said no we're here we're gonna stay and we're gonna be in the country that we are brought up in and we're gonna live here it's gonna be all fine even though bombs are going all around us but however one bomb did drop but it dropped on his brother and splattered his brother across the street literally in pieces wonder what that'd be like to witness that his mother obviously who was very distraught would not accept the fact that there would be no coffin with no body in it and so he was encouraged to go along the street and pick up all parts of his brother's corpse and he did so for his mother and he put her the brother into a coffin the bits of the body that he found and then he left because he told him i told you to live when you didn't one other woman she stated that she said i don't think i'll ever overcome the smell of the bodies when we woke up in the morning and the smell of the bodies decaying on the streets after being butchered and slaughtered and another woman stated where her where her husband her father her husband and her son and grandchild was murdered so what I'm simply saying here is that when we put it into perspective and we look at our little problems that occur in our lives and then put them into perspective of what goes on in the other life, what I'm simply saying is the instruction that I'm putting forward has to do with the every other day, little normal situation and experiences that we have, not the extreme ones. Because I don't think anything I've said will actually even enhance or help a person who's in an extreme case. I've seen this other thing, just a, another show, and a documentary, and the documentary is about this a school in Africa and from the forward glance, from the first glance of it all, you just look and you see this school in Africa. And all these children are all in their uniforms and they seem fine. And they're all playing in the yard and they're walking through the schools. And the school's okay, like it's, it's well built, blah, 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 and all that. However, what the interviewer, the investigating journalist explains is that every single one of those children that are in that school, every single one of them are there because of a particular reason. And the reason why they're there is because they witnessed their mother and father being murdered. Every one of those students. And their mother wasn't murdered. She was also very badly abused before they killed her. A lot of these women. And these young children, that was their eye opener to their first or awakening to what goes on in life. And every single one of them had gone through that experience. And yet afterwards interviewing them and the guy was up talking to them. They were very sweet children. Very gentle children. It's amazing what childhood is, the innocence of childhood. But yet that's what I'm simply saying. The stories that I'm bringing, the application of life, the, the ability to overcome in certain particular manners is just to deal with the every ordinary day situation. And again, John Hume, when we looked at, when we look going back to John Hume before we finish, and I grew up in the 70s myself, and I seen the video footage, when it wasn't video footage, it was actually television footage, reported from what was going on in Northern Ireland, very similar in a sense to what was going on in Iraq, Belfast, the Divis Flats, the Falls Road, all that, oh, just bombarded with explosions and bombs and killing 3,000 people, over 3,000 people, Diet, that's not something to overlook. But yet in our modern day world, it's easy to forget. But when you look at the footage and the video footage of what went on up there, horrendous, horrific, horrendous and horrific. And yet John Hume again stood out and shined like a be beacon of light, a beacon of light, a beacon of hope for people. And that was the purpose, I suppose, where he woke up every single day to believe, to hope, the things would change and he pressed forward towards it all without any shred of doubt. So as I said, as we were talking earlier, it's good sometimes to take a look at somebody else's life and see what you can learn from it. See if you can emulate some sort of characteristic to help them through their lives. 
And sometimes it's good to put in to go into the gym before the, the before the battle goes on. In life, a lot of times when you, if, you, if you look at, for example, boxers, boxers train in the gym before the fight. In our human experience, what we do is we try to take the fight back into the gym after the fight. Of course, it doesn't generally work. So what I'm simply saying is, is when we get the opportunity to try and develop the character that would help us in a problematic situation, it's better off trying to do it before the battle arrives rather than trying to do it while the battle comes. And sometimes it's simple. Where do you fall down in life? Where's your, where's your handicap? Where's the problem? Are you a person that own, takes ownership of your problems and are honest? Are you a person that doesn't? Well, take a look at that particular area and begin to start working in that particular area. Because it will enhance your life and it will enhance the people around you. That's the whole point and the whole purpose of this. It isn't just for you to be a better person in this life. But it's also for you to bring a better experience to other people's lives. And that's the whole reason why we're in this planet. That's the whole journey. To leave down the baggage to change as we go through life. Not to be the same person you were 30 years ago. I never change. I never see anything change in your life. Because you need to change. That's the whole process of maturity. That we need to change. So in other words, if I was a problematic person that exploded, was aggressive in my mannerism, and I was in a family situation and I was exploding and being aggressive towards people, those people get affected by it. But once I change, they don't get affected by it anymore. So my purpose in life is to change for the betterment of others, not only for self-gain, because self-gain sometimes can be unrewarding when it's actually brought out into the life of what it really is. It can be very unrewarding. And the other way around, believe it or not, when you take the time to change, the change in your life, there generally isn't too many applause people won't applaud you. Because see, when you bring change to your life, one of the things you do do is you bring conviction to others. And generally what conviction does is it either causes somebody to walk the same path you've done or else take the finger and point it at you. But what the, re the reward of it all is is when you go through test after test after test and you begin to start seeing the inward change in you, that's the reward in itself. The world may not applaud you. Nobody may never remember you. They might never write stories about you. But the only thing you're going to live when you leave this planet, and there's a guarantee that we're all going to go there, is that your integrity will be the thing that will be remembered. Remember what I said earlier. He was a good man. He was a good son. She was a great mother. She was a great grandmother. Always the very characteristics and the beatitudes and the attitudes that you brought to this life will be the very thing that will be remembered. It won't be about much money you made or how successful you were. In actual fact, and I've known of this, where people have made some money, substantial money, and when they died, the thing that was said about them was they weren't nice people. And remember I said earlier, the difference between being a nice person and a kind person is two complete different routes. A kind person will be truthful. Regardless of what comes his way, you're wrong in that. He's being kind. A nice person will say, I don't worry about it. They don't want conflict. They don't want to be involved in conflict. So they become nice people. But nice people and kind people are two different people. Be a kind person. Anyway, this is George Fitzgerald on 92.5 Phoenix FM. The name of the show is called Motivational Journeys. And what I'm going to do is here today, is this, this evening, I'm going to sign out. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope in some way we took something from the life of John Hume. And remember one thing. There's no point in applauding a man who tells the story of another man. It's not the man who tells the story, but it's the man who lived it. It's not about me, it's about John Hume and what he did. Not about worry, partly about the man that he lived it. He lived it, he walked it, he talked it. So it's to look at John Young and to take a look at how he, how, how he, how he endeavoured to go through what he went through and the characteristics in which he developed. Anyway, as I said again, this is George Fitzgerald, 92.5, Phoenix FM. So I know, hope you enjoy the show. God willing, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.